you're a fashion and bicycle and walking. You probably probably realize that, right? I'm gonna get this right to going here. So when my mom was uh, 15, she marched me down to the uh, DMV, which is the, to get my driver's license, because I had three little brothers who needed rides everywhere. And so that's what they call a soccer mom, right? But I was a soccer sister. And they, uh, by the time, and the, the lifestyle the, at this point was I watched a lot of television, I ate a lot of junk food, and I drove everywhere. And by the time I was 15 and 16 teenager, I was overweight and depressed, no wonder, right? Then fast forward a few years, and one of my brothers said, I'm going to graduate school in Washington, D.C., and one of my brothers says, take my bike. And I say, why would I take your bike? Well, why would I do that? And he says, this so-called environmentalist, maybe you should get off your lazy butt. Then you'll stop complaining about being fat. Well, there's nothing like a little sibling heckling to get the blood flowing, right? I said, fine, I will take your bike. At first, I couldn't get up even the wimpiest hill without pushing. I was in bad shape. But soon, I lost weight and felt great. I started biking everywhere for every kind of trip. That small fortune that I'd spent on diet plans and gym memberships and exercise videos, like going on dates with people you don't like, and you're stuck with the bill. Over and over and over. But bicycling didn't feel like exercise because I was getting where I needed to go. So from then on, the bicycle became my main means of transportation. My first job out of grad school was researching international transportation issues. In growing Asian and Latin American cities, massive investments were poured into road building. The results, fit congestion, horrific air quality, health, and safety problems. In European and Japanese cities where the emphasis was on compact development, bicycling, walking, and transit, congestion went down and health and air quality and safety improved. For me, this was an epiphany at the crossroads of my personal transformation and sustainable transportation stood a win-win solution, the bicycle. And with this epiphany came clarity. I wanted to transform American cities into bicycle-friendly places. And with clarity came luck. So I landed the job of bicycle coordinator in this the progressive city of, of Portland, Oregon. Now my family down in Texas was less than thrilled by this. It's my stepdad, Tommy. And he said, on behalf of the family, this environmental crap is for y'all hippies. <laughs> Americans are not going to ride bicycles for transportation. And, and he did have a point, I have to admit. For a hundred years, we have designed our cities around driving. We have cemented our addiction to driving through our land use development, traffic management, use of public space, building design. The notion of that we could overcome a century of car-oriented social engineering seems preposterous, even in Portland. Now, some of you have been to Portland, right? Yes, a few. And you know, you probably walked or ridden a bike there. I mean, it's a pretty cool place to bike and walk, right? So people often think that we just woke up one morning and there were people riding bikes everywhere, just all over the place. But no. This is a myth. In the early days, Portland was built around the streetcar, and then the automobile came to Portland in full force post World War II. Just like the rest of North America, streetcar tracks were paved over and ripped out. By the 1960s, Portland's air was foul, the number of crashes and fatalities soaring. Businesses fled to the suburbs, parents followed suit, our, our schools were empty with middle class families. This is downtown Portland at that era, it's a bunch of surface parking lots. 
not a terribly attractive place to do business or to go downtown to uh, buy anything. To the east of Portland lies beautiful Mount Hood. And the driving route to get there, this is the most popular recreational destination in Oregon. Um, recreation also meaning big business because people ski there, right? So it's a super popular, beautiful mountain. And the planners at the time had one last highway on the books. The big, thick black lines are the highways that were already built going through neighborhood after neighborhood. And the dashed line that says Mountain Freeway that goes from the center to this direction. The freeway was on the books and the planners were working on it and it would rip through Southeast Portland. And actually, the, black, the dashed black line was right over the house that I lived in for many years. So this neighborhood, and you can imagine that when you think the high of the government is going to come by your house or take your house for decades, because it's been on the books, uh, that means that this was an entirely degraded neighborhood. But at this point in the 70s, residents have had enough. And they organized themselves around a group called Stop Sensible Transportation Options for People. And they fought, and they won. Instead of the highway, money was to, that same money was put into light rail, a first light rail line max, and a downtown parking lot was transformed into our town square, Pioneer Square, that probably some of you saw when you were in Portland. One of the ugly freeways uh, right in the heart of downtown along the river, half the freeway was taken up and made into a park. The impact of these transformational acts on the city of Portland and the culture cannot be overstated. Businesses got into the act too. They actually agreed to have a, uh, a limit on the number of parking spaces available and have no free parking in the downtown, which is huge. Regional leaders also got into the act and adopted uh, an urban growth boundary so that we could not, so we can still sprawl, but not that much. We can sprawl a little less. At least we can contain the sprawl. And they also envisioned a network of parks throughout the entire region and trails. And together, leaders and residents researched and debated and grew solid in their mutual understanding that the places, the land, that land use, the places people live, work, and play go hand in hand with transportation and how we get to those places. So there you go. The myth is debunked, right? Portland was once polluted, degraded, and near abandoned like a lot of cities in North America. But we chose a different path and are simply ahead of where many cities are towards balanced, sustainable transportation systems. On the bicycling front, Port Oregon had passed a law way back in 1971 that was possibly the North America's first complete streets bill. And it said that a minimum of 1% of transportation funding, so like at the provincial level, this would be at the provincial level, that a minimum of 1% of transportation funding had to be spent on bicycling and walking. And, probably even more importantly, that this is the complete streets part, that bike and pedestrian, appropriate bikeways and walkways had to be included in every major transportation project, including road rebuilding. Not just, not just resurfacing, the entire road had to be rebuilt, but and then this group here that you see is our task force that started meeting in 1973, so two years before your uh, first bicycle pedestrian advisory committee. Now our, our advisory committee is still meeting today and has not been disbanded, so I, I would encourage you to reform it because it's really important to have a citizens group that is uh, looking after all bike and pedestrian matters and advising the city and getting involved and, 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 and kind of being that much job. So I just like to encourage you. He basically kind of gave me a, a Vulcan mind meld and said, 
you go forth and do it. Okay, most of our roads in Portland when I arrived in the early 90s had no bikes. We had few people biking, as you can imagine, and the entire bureaucracy was focused on moving cars. So that's where we started. What could be cheaper? Let's get that to work with businesses. So I go talk to business, the business community and they say, bike parking. So the business community says, bike parking? Why would we need bike parking? There's plenty of bike parking already. No one's using it. And I would show them these pictures. And I would say, I don't really think that we have enough bike parking. And I think what we do have is located on the third floor of the parking garage behind the dumpster. It's not real, there's a reason why people aren't using the bike parking that we have. And they said, what are you going to force us to put in next? Ski racks? Or toy chests? Because they saw the bicycle as one of two things, either a sport or a toy. Which it is, but it's also a serious means of transportation. So we had a long way to go. I started following a bike trailer around the city of Portland with a projector in it. And I would talk to neighborhood and civic groups, anyone, anyone who would listen to my epiphany story and a few fascinating words about transportation policy and problems. that there are ways to reform and, and re-infuse our community with bicycling and walking. And people would talk to me. They would say that their doctors need, their doctors had told them they needed to get more exercise. Or that they wanted their kids to be able to bike to school like they had once done. So I figured that if in each group I was talking to, two or three or four opened their minds to bicycling, that meant I was influencing 10 to 20% of the population. Not bad. And in 1996, City Council blessed our plan to make the bicycle an integral part of daily life in Portland. And all those people that I talked to became like our spokespeople, like our army, as we moved forward to implement the plan. Now, we started with the low-hanging fruit, which was shaving a foot or two off of each travel lane. And we, and I want to talk for a second about the travel lane group, because I know Calvary's really struggling with this. And that is that our engineers had a big debate, went and looked at the standards that were out there and the evidence that was there. And they came to the conclusion that narrower travel lanes were good for everybody. Not just bicyclists, because yes, we could find space for bike lanes, but good for motorists as well because it lowered the travel speeds and therefore reduced crashes. And it would reduce the severity of crashes. So they agreed to go down to a 10-foot travel lane width on almost every road in the city of Portland. Who wants to do the, the calculation for me? Is that, uh, what is the meter? What is the meters on that? 3.05. 3.05. Okay. So they agreed to do that. So we were able to get in a lot of bike lanes that way. But we also started doing what we call a road diet, where you trade off a travel or parking lane for bike lanes. One of the first we tackled was on a six-lane bridge with really narrow sidewalks called the Burnside. And at the time, you had two choices. You could either squeeze in those travel lanes with cars, or you could squeeze on that sidewalk with pedestrians, and neither of which is a good option, right? So Cork or Zemi, hardly anybody was biking on that bridge, obviously. So the city decided that we were going to go ahead and put bike lanes on this bridge. But folks were worried. Would there, because this was like the first time we had done it. Would there be, uh, would we spark up just a nasty outcry? Would we, uh, would angry motorists like storm City Hall? But Congress, uh, uh, City Councilman Blumenauer said to us, this isn't a stealth operation. It's a celebration. Let's do it with style. So we rented, uh, so we hired bands, and we rented some porta potties, and we offered food vendors the opportunity to come up, and we declared Bike Fest on the Burnside Bridge, a car-free celebration. 
proliferation of alternative transportation. The night before, the crews came out and repainted the lane lines, so there was no turning back. We were done, and we had no idea what to expect. And that morning, that by noon that day, 10,000 people were up on that bridge. 10,000 people were up on that bridge celebrating. And we learned something that day, okay, and that is that it's not just the strikes, the strikes are important, but it's the attitude. If we plan and build our cities around driving and operate them that way, then that's what we're all going to do, okay, that's what we're all going to do. But if we plan and build and operate them around bicycling and walking, and then we tell people about it in ways that are meaningful to their lives, then that's what we'll do. We have to embrace this approach at every level of government, that it's not just about the infrastructure, it is about the encouragement. And so there are three specific encouragement activities that I have learned that are the most effective at true social change to get people to use that network. One, personalized travel encouragement program. So this program that we've been across North America. You take a swap of the city, something like we've been doing neighborhoods of about um, 3,000 at a time, and we we basically blitz the neighborhood stuff right there. We, uh, we first ask people, would you like information about bicycling and walking off of a really nice looking survey? And then we follow up whatever they said they wanted. They want a personalized bike map to get from where they are to where they're going. Coupons for the bus. within a week, by bike, a nice tote bag with all the things they requested. And then for the next six weeks, we blitz the neighborhood with absolutely delightfully fun activities at the schools, at the churches, at the farmer's markets, at the libraries, so where people are. And we excite them and infuse them with biking and walking is fun. And we have found that these programs ship 9 to 13% of drive-along trips to biking and walking and transit, depending on the neighborhood. And we've done this now in, all, in a number of communities, and we find no matter what neighborhood, no matter what community, we're able to get similar shifts. Now, just one caveat. It does not work if you have no transit service. You can't promote transit with no transit service. If you have a really crummy micro walk network, much harder to uh, get people to do it. So it's, it really has to go along with whatever infrastructure you have. Next, it, go ahead, one more is Safe Routes to School. So Safe Routes to School is not, and I really appreciate what you're doing here in Toronto with all your bike walk, um, school-based activities. So what I'm talking about is the next level, which is bike education and encouragement activities are in the school. Every single elementary school, as part of their curriculum, is teaching bike safety. We have been doing this in Portland now. At, um, we started with 25 schools, now we have almost every elementary school involved. And the change is phenomenal. We've gone from having almost nobody biking and walking. At my own kids' school, we have 40% of the kids biking and walking now. Traffic is gone. The kids are almost all relatively fit looking. The principal loves it. She says, fit, healthy kids learn better. When the principals are embracing this, you know you're in the, heading in the right direction, right? The third, uh, I don't have the right slide for this, but the third is the sequel of Can you just go back? Gil Penulosa, which I, has already told you all about this, right? You're all fond of the sequel of So I just want to give you a twist on the sequel of which is, I know you have a car free event every year, but the, the sequel of is that are, um, I've seen across North America that are the most exciting, uh, well, they're all exciting. Try it in the neighborhood. Try it where you're trying to get people to bike. So if you're trying, you're, you're, you're celebrating your new bike way, and I want you to think about um, different types of bike ways. So you've got bike routes I know that you use, which are more like uh, just signs on a neighborhood street, but those should become what we call bicycle boulevards or neighborhood greenways, where you've really taken steps to make those streets work well for bikes. Have, have your event in the neighborhood to really show people the roots. Make it into a community celebration. It's 
It's not just about biking and walking, it's about getting humans to experience their public space differently. So if you just have it in the business district, that's great, do that. But also try to have it in your neighborhood on routes that you want people to use and do those secret meals. So I was talking about bike lanes, but I do want to talk about separation as well because bike lanes are important and I think they're really, really good. But, and, but if we were to design our cities from scratch, we, we created a network of completely separated bike routes. Completely separated. We would not have to add on motor vehicles at all. It's very, very confident males that will take the, the road uh, in their spandex and cookie shoes. <laughs> Anybody in the room like that? It's okay. <laughs> What we found is that once we start putting in really good bike lanes, bike boulevards, we start to attract a whole other level of 67% of the population that we call enthusiastic and confident. Won't we'll ride on those busy roads without stuff, maybe a little bit to get more confident. Mostly want to stay on those bike lanes, bike boulevards, and whatnot. That's me. Anybody else? But what we also know is that there's a huge percentage of the population that is interested in cycling but concerned about safety. And to really capture those folks, we have to create low-stress, protected bikeways or low-stress, uh, very minimal car interaction bikeways where the, different, the speed differential is very low. So we have to lower the stress. So in Portland, we, have, uh, we focus a lot on bike lanes, but we also started focusing on off-street trails. Now, Portland's got this river right in the middle of downtown. And we had a freeway on one side that I showed you already, but we also had a freeway on the other side. And this is what it looked like. Uh, and this was obviously an extremely bad idea to plop a freeway right down next to the river. And city, city officials realized very quickly that they were stuck with a lemon that was taking up precious uh, riverfront property. And they spent two decades trying to decide whether to bury it or move it or demolish it. And finally they decided, let's just live with this monster. We'll just ignore it, and we'll build a trail right next to it. But as you can see, where are you going to put a trail? We've got a highway literally right next to the river. So they decide, well, we're going to put it next to the river where we can. We'll build up the riverfront, and parts of it we're going to float in the river. And in the, in the United States, that's an extremely difficult thing to do. There's an awful lot of government regulation we have to get over. So it took 10 years, 10 years to get over it all and build this, uh, build this trail. This is what it looked like before. We did a little spit of land in some spots, but it wasn't terribly effective, right? But in the end, we were able to build this beautiful, beautiful trail. And the amazing thing that happened was the newspaper, the main newspaper, the Oregonian, didn't like it. They called it just a noisy new pencil thin park along the freeway. They said it was the most expensive thing built in the city of Portland, that it was a waste of money and that no one would use it. Now in 2001, you guys know what happened on 9-11, right? So 10 days after that, thousands of people came down to the river and they stood on this trail and they held candles and then they made a ring around the river on the bridges and the other trail. That was waterfront park that I showed you. And the entire thousands of people are out there uh, in solidarity and mourning for the victim of 9-11. And the next day, the Oregonian ate their words. And by the end of the year, they declared the best investment of the year. And this happened time and again. Time and again. Ridicule turned to acceptance. Fears overcome by delightful reality. And we learned that backlash is normal because changing built infrastructure and deeply ingrained habits is really hard stuff. Really hard stuff. And I know it feels like you're having a little bit of a backlash here, right? Hello? <laughs> <laughs> but we took our lumps and we kept going, okay? This is our bike lane network circa 1980s, not a lot. We started filling it in with bike lanes and these neighborhood greenways, these bike boulevards as I talked about, beautiful neighborhood streets, and these off-street trails, and lots of really good bike parking spaces. And by the turn of the millennium, we had almost 300 miles of bikeways, and we've kept going since then. But I want to tell you that around the turn of the millennium, something happened, and that is our politicians switched. And the Rural Women Hour went to the, um, the big Congress and 
so we had a new city, we had a new city council and they weren't that much into bike stuff. And I personally went on maternity leave. And when I came back, they told me they handed me a memo that said they had eliminated the bike program. And at this point I had built it up and I had uh, five staff and a million and a half dollars a year and was putting in bike roads everywhere and they gutted it and they also gutted the pedestrian program and they told us all basically you can you can stay, but we're gonna find different jobs for you. Yeah. It was a bummer. <laughs> I decided it was time to move on myself. And I will tell you that that was a low point that the, the really set us all back. And for a number of years, not a lot happened in Portland um, in terms of bikeways. I mean, the guy that was left continued. And then some of you heard Roger Geller when he was here a few years ago. So he, he, he remained in the position and he, he kept going. But when you go from having a whole group and a ton of support at the political level and at the leadership level down to one person, it's hard to be effective. It's really hard to be effective if you're just one person. So, uh, and things did not change until we got a whole new city council and a new mayor that, and, that started rebuilding the bike program and reinfusing the department. So I guess I would just say on that level, sometimes these, these lower periods give you an opportunity to go back and retrench, kind of get your thinking squared about what, how you put your effort, give the advocates a chance to really, you know, organize but you've got to just keep going. Wherever you are, you've just got to keep going uh, and stay focused on what you're trying to do and take heart. Over time, we started doing all kinds of other programs. We started adding color in conflict areas. We started adding bikeway signage, wayfinding signage to tie the network together. And I do want to point out that I really like the signs that the city put in because they don't just have the mileage, they have the time. Do you have these already? So it says here one, minute, one mile or five minutes, so it's based on a 10 mile an hour cycling speed, which is very slow. That's me and my skirt and my high heel boots following two kids in the back. Kind of slow, right? And, but it's a little bit of a trick because a lot of people get there faster than that. So it says 10 minutes, but they get there in six or seven or eight, and they think, oh, I'm strong, I'm fast. Psychologically, then, they want to keep doing it, so that the time is important. We also started adding in bike-specific traffic signals and other European safety techniques, really good bike parking, and businesses, about a decade after they spurned us, the city offered a program to trade off car parking for bike parking. One auto space equals one customer, and 10 bike racks equals 20 customers, right? Now this is smart business. And immediately, coffee shops and cool bars and restaurants start saying, hey, yeah, go over here, us, us, us. And there's about 65 of these bike corrals that are in place today. And there's a, like 200 bike businesses on a waiting list. The city of Portland continued to innovate. And not just the city of Portland, as you know, but lots of cities across North America have started to look at how can we make those bike lanes better? Okay, bike lanes are good. But how can we make them better? Because uh, lots of people are uncomfortable riding on bike lanes. I'm not going to let my kids ride on a bike lane on a major road. That's not going to feel good. So to get to that 60% interested but concern, more separation. And as I said, we started infusing bike safety, education, and events into our schools. It takes a generation to change things. We have to reinfuse back into our kids that bicycling and walking that this is simply how we get around. Just one last quick story. When I started working at the city of Portland, we discovered that uh, there was a really big problem with glass and bike lanes and uh, uh, bad maintenance and uh, broken and drainage breaks that you would catch a wheel on and all kinds of problems. And I went to the maintenance bureau and said, hey guys, how about sweeping those bike lanes? And they looked at me like I was from the moon. Why would they sweep bike lanes? What are you talking about? So I ended up going over to the maintenance bureau with a, a box of donuts, and I went out with them on the, the night crew. So they, they let me go in with them to this uh, with a street sweeper. We go out at night, and we go over the Burnside Bridge bike line where there are a ton of complaints. And the guy sweeps it, but then we get out, we walk over to the, to the bike line, and we see that there's still glass in the bike line twinkling into the night sky. So we go back to the street, street sweeper. He jumps back in the cab and starts flipping all these switches like a mad scientist. And he basically starts adjusting the setting. And we 
you go back over the bike lane, he sweeps it again, and voila, the glass is gone. And I collect data for a year on where are all the uh, problems in the bike lanes, and I, then I go back to the maintenance bureau and say, uh, here's our map showing that we, Burnside Bridge, for example, is complaints all the time. And he says, oh, well, we go over the Burnside Bridge every night to downtown, so we can just sweep it every night. How's that? And I said, well, great. I wish you had told me that a year ago, but we'll take it. And this is one of the other keys, is that with the right combination of top-down of top leadership and bottom-up bottom up willingness, we can solve almost any problem. Okay, we can work together to find solutions and institutionalize new ways of thinking into transportation policy and practice with almost no cost. So this is another piece to integrate bicycling and fuse bicycling and walking into every aspect of transportation. I got a little messed up with the keys because of the slides, so I'll tell you some of the keys. One, the political leadership. So thank you to uh, the councilman who was here earlier and all the politicians that are supportive. We need your support, and you all keep supporting them. Uh, second is we need really good staff that are really well trained in this, and it can't just be one person that needs to be infused throughout the department. Um, we need to have that focus on not just the bike ways, but the encouragement activities, the institutionalization is absolutely critical. We need to start focusing on more separation. And we've been working with cities all across North America and through my consulting firm to find ways to upgrade and improve these facilities. Our bikeway network needs to be comprehensive and connected, made up of different types of bikeways, including bike lanes, separated bike lanes, bike boulevards and neighborhood greenways, separated paths, and all of it needs to work together. It's not an either or, it all works together. Together with all these other cities, we formed a coalition, the Cities for Cycling Coalition, and we put together a fantastic new guide called the Cities for Cycling Guide. I'm going to give you that reference here. All right, you know, I'm going to skip that. Let me get back to the Cities for Cycling Guide. I just want to tell you some of the numbers. One of the other keys is document what you're doing. And I understand that there was a count that was done in 2010 with bicycling in Toronto. I wish you had counts from 10 years ago so you could tell your story. Uh, but you've got to tell your story over time. Now, in the early 1990s, less than 1% of people were biking in Portland. Today, 8% of commute trips are by bike. 15% to 18% of Portlanders use the bicycle at least some of the time. 30% in some neighborhoods. This shows bridge bicycle traffic. This is the documenting our usage. We've been documenting our usage in Portland now for more than 20 years. So we can definitively show that as, that as we built the bikeway network, this is the mileage of bikeways, the bike use has gone up and up and up and up. On some corridors, bikes account for 20% of traffic or more. No matter how you slice and dice it, bike use is going up. These are just different ways of uh, tracking it. Bike use has gone up, this is the green line, and on the four downtown bridges, this is four bridges, car use has remained flat, so we've increased traffic on these four bridges by 20%, but all of that traffic is bike traffic. As bike use has gone up, the crash rate has gone down. You've seen that in lots of other North American cities. Lots of kids are biking. We've created a $100 million bike industry with 1,500 local green jobs. Politicians like that, right? Jobs. We've done, how much did all of this cost? The entire bikeway network and all the encouragement activities could be had today for about $60 million. And that kind of sounds like a lot of money, right? But that cost is less than 1% of the transportation budget. 1%. And that would buy us one mile Freeway. That's one heck of a bang for buck investment, right? One heck of a bang for buck investment. So keep counting those bikes, keep counting the pedestrians, every year issue some kind of report, get those trend lines going. We have spearheaded a project in uh, the United States, but you can certainly use it here, I guess you might not. It's called the National Bicycle and Pedestrian Documentation Project. We have all the forms online so that you can use a consistent count methodology. From a traffic modeling perspective, we have to have a consistent method of counting. So we put this all online, and you can see we've got all kinds of adjustment factors and modeling techniques to use this in the National Bicycle and Pedestrian Documentation Project. Of course, it's not just
just Portland that's realizing the fabulous benefits of bicycling and walking all across North America. I know that these are basically just symbols on where my company's working, so it doesn't show all the great stuff in, in Canada. Uh, I'll work a little bit over in uh, Vancouver, a little bit here in, in, in Ottawa, and a little bit over in uh, the whole, all the problems. We've been working on the public bike sharing with Bixi. Actually, we're partnered with Bixi in Melbourne, Washington, D.C., in Boston, and a number of other cities. It's unfortunate. We'd love to be working here, but okay, so we but it is amazing what's happening with public bike sharing, isn't it? That's a game changer. I think I want to add it to the keys for success for the future, as, as much as we see and how much is transformational. So the Cities Recycling Guide uh, is what I was telling you about the Coalition of Cities. And I wanted to end with this because we've got to design our bikeways to a higher standard in North America than we've done so far. Given that most of the information on how to design these bikeways was lacking from the North American design manuals, particularly the American design manuals, we put together a fabulous guide that's online. It's the Cities for Cycling Guide. And I'm just, just quickly showing you it's really cool. It's uh, vibrant. It's got all kinds of cool graphics at different angles. It's got uh, all kinds of pop-up stuff to show you different ways to protect the bike lane different ways to integrate it into your street system. Lots and lots of rich detail on how to do this stuff. Traffic engineering talk, a resource guide of where everything comes from. We had an international panel of folks working on this. Case studies of where this stuff has been done. Actual detail, engineering detail for engineers that want to get into the details. Let me just end in Dallas, Texas, because here's the final thing. We're all part of the solution, right? So that means that all of us, no matter where we live or work, no matter how many kids we have or obstacles we perceive, we all have to bike and walk on more trips starting now. 40% of trips in North America are less than two miles. So all of us can find at least one trip a week that's a driving trip now, let's say to the store, or restaurant, or friend's house, or park, that we can switch to foot or bike. And we can all start doing that today. Even in places like Dallas, Texas, they're taking baby steps. They build a trail, it's called the Katy Trail, and it's very, very popular, but it only goes three miles. So they hired my firm to come in and envision what would happen on their downtown streets if they built a 20 mile network of bike paths on downtown streets in downtown Dallas. And my God, if they can achieve this in downtown Dallas. Yeah, and they're willing to go down to 10 foot travel lanes in Dallas, where everybody drives a Hummer. <laughs> then I don't think we have, the rest of us have no excuses. And so I was in Dallas, and I went to visit my, my parents. And I go to visit my, my parents' house, and my stepfather gives me a big hug. And he says, um, come out to the garage. He beckons me to the garage. Where proudly displayed is a speedy new road bike. <laughs> and I noticed suddenly that he looks great. He's 72 years old at the time and in the best shape of his life. And my mom says, I finally get what you've been saying all these years about biking being good because if it's good for Tommy, then it's good for me, and therefore it's good for the world, right? From her to the world. <laughs> Now, just come on, let's go ride. So wherever you are, enjoy the ride. Thank you.